Hi, welcome YVV. Uh, welcome to another edition of Let the Psalm Speak. We've got our very special guests, Ben Chenoweth. Welcome, mate. Hey, good to be here. Thank you. And Adzi, Adzi Benna. Welcome, man. How's everybody? <laughs> good, good. Uh, stoked you guys could be here. Thanks so much for being a part of it. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, when we started this Let the Psalm Speak, we didn't know it was going to snowball into like all these little meetings with, with each other but um it's been pretty cool actually uh, we, we're mm. guys love we're loving the conversational style message thing so it's really good mm. so thanks thanks heaps um so um just a few guys at home uh what we've been doing is just getting together and, and talking to some people from our family about what psalms are actually impacting their lives at the moment so um uh, we're doing a deep dive into the psalms and it's um yeah, it's, it's been really cool to see what, what all the different angles that people are experiencing out of that awesome book. So um, why, why don't we just kick it off? And um, Adam, why don't, you, why don't you go for What psalm are you looking at? Sure. I'm, I'm actually looking at uh, Psalm 29 is the one that I've, uh, that I've picked. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can go through that with us if we like. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, well, I mean, my, I think one of the reasons why I really like this song, my background is actually in literary studies. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, so like poetry really, that works for me. It doesn't work for everybody. It's not everybody's cup of tea, but it really works for me. And I love the structure of poetry. And the structure of Hebrew poetry is really interesting because you have these, uh, it's very common in Hebrew poetry to have couplets that we, we call it parallelism. A couplet, if you don't know what it is, it's actually just two lines of poetry that are linked together. And so Hebrew couplets usually tend to work where the first line states something, states a theme. And then the second line of the couplet restates that theme using slightly different language or a slightly different way of going. And so you'll hear that in this song and mm-hmm. it's really, it's structured so beautifully, this, the song, because the first part of Psalm 29 is like a call to worship mm-hmm. and it says, ascribe to Yahweh, O heavenly beings, ascribe to Yahweh glory and strength, ascribe to Yahweh the glory of his name, worship Yahweh in holy splendor. And that's the call to worship. And then you get this cool second section of this psalm, which is just beautiful. And the whole thing is about the voice of God or the voice of Yahweh. And it, it just continually, you hear the repetition over and over. The voice, this is starting verse 3. The voice of Yahweh is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. Yahweh over mighty waters. The voice of Yahweh is powerful. The voice of Yahweh is full of majesty. The voice of Yahweh breaks the cedars. Yahweh breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of Yahweh flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of Yahweh shakes the wilderness. Yahweh shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. So you can hear that parallelism there in those, in those couplets. The voice of Yahweh causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, all say glory. And then we get this final section that sort of mirrors the call to worship at the beginning. Yahweh sits enthroned over the flood. Yahweh sits enthroned as king forever. May Yahweh give strength to his people. May Yahweh bless his people with peace. And it's a nice, it's just a lovely, tight little psalm. Mm. Uh, It's so worshipful. Uh, and it's just so beautifully constructed. I just love the poetry in it. And that's, that's one that speaks. There's a lot of songs that speak to me, um, but just in actually preparing for this and sort of reading through some of the ones that I knew better than others, that one kind of stuck out. And that's why I, that's why I opted for it uh, to kind of read through it. Um, I think it sort of speak, it almost speaks for itself, doesn't it? But we'll talk, we'll talk more about it a little later. Yeah, it's beautiful, actually. It was funny when I did this with a couple other people. It's have, it hasn't gone out yet, so I won't say who, but um, <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about the voice of God, you know, and, and the, literally the, the, the spoken word of God um, and, and, and the power of it, you know, and that psalm's just absolutely beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. thanks, Ads. That's great. Lovely. Yeah. So what, Ben... Uh, What's uh, Ben? What's your what's the song that you uh, <laughs> decided to kick on with? Well, it's a good contrast. Um, I've chosen a psalm from uh, later on in history. So that was a, a psalm of David, according to its um, ascription. Um, this one uh, is a psalm that comes from a, a much later period, uh, Psalm 137. Um, so this is uh, seen sort of as a, a psalm of exile. Uh, but there's a very interesting 
word in here. Uh, I'll get to it when we get to it in verse two and three. It says there. And so when we get to that verse, you'll realize that it's actually not a psalm that was written in that context. It's, it's actually been written later, reflecting back on the exilic experience. Um, and so, yeah, I think that um, brings out just a little bit of something which, yeah, we'll, we'll see it in a sec. And the other thing you'll know from this psalm, of course, is the Boney M song. Um, by the rivers of Babylon. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's this one. Uh, it's very yeah. very hard to get that out of your head. Um, <laughs> when, when I start reading it, you'll 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 start singing it practically. Um, but it's interesting. They really only dealt with the first couple of um, verses in the psalm. They didn't go very far, mm. um, and there's probably a good reason for that. Once we get to verse uh, nine you can see why you wouldn't put that in a pop song. So I guess you should, um, should read it, Psalm 137, um, NIV translation. Yeah. Uh, By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if, if I do not remember you, if, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. <laughs> yeah, verse nine. <laughs> right. You don't, you don't get that um, in a pop song. No. <laughs> um, interestingly, when the sons of Korah sang this song, um, their version is beautiful, really beautiful. And then right at the end of that, they sort of, the guy, I've, I've spoken to Matt Jacoby, let me name drop a bit, and mm. I, don't, I know he talks about that last, um, that last verse and they, they couldn't avoid it. They had to put it in. Um, so he sort of fudges it a little and says something or other about progeny and, and, and maybe that's because it rhymes with something I can't remember. But, you know, you're sort of left feeling, what, was they say? what were they singing? What were they saying? But mm. it's very clear. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. And that's where this beautiful psalm ends. Mm. Um, so this is a psalm about remembering. Um, that's the key word that, that, that is following um, the, right the way through this psalm. So uh, it starts where we're in Babylon, or at least we're remembering the time when we were in Babylon. Um, and we remembered Zion. Zion's just the fancy word for Jerusalem. And then our captors said, sing a song of Zion. Well, since you're thinking about Zion, sing a song about Zion. But then how could we do that in a foreign land? Verse 5, if I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. So this is the opposite of remembering. Um, we don't want to forget what happened to Jerusalem. Um, and, and so I would rather forget how to play the harp or the piano, um, then, then forget Jerusalem and what happened to Jerusalem. Now, as a piano player, I don't want to be able to, don't want to forget how to play the piano. It's, it's such an integral part of me and my, my music and my worship. I worship when I'm playing piano. Yeah. Uh, and and you can, I can so imagine this guy going, oh, I want to sing the songs of Zion. I want to get my harp and play it and sing those songs. But... How can I do that? They're songs of joy and we are in exile. Yeah, right. Um, and so verse 6, um, I, I don't even want to sing. I, I want my, my tongue to cling to the roof of my mouth um, if I don't remember Jerusalem. Jerusalem, is, is, it's, it's in my thoughts. It's the only thing I'm thinking about. Hmm. Then there's a bit of a turning point because then um, the psalmist starts directing his um, remembrance pleas to God. And he says in verse 7, remember what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Well, remember, I'm remembering what happened to Jerusalem. Well, 
God, I want you to remember what the Edomites did. They said, tear it down, Jerusalem, tear it down, tear it down to its foundations. Mm. And then even worse, remember what Babylon did to us. Mm. Um, Verse 8, happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. That's what Babylon did to Jerusalem Mm. or to the people of Jerusalem. Mm. And the psalmist it's essentially a plea for God to be just. Mm. Um, the, the Old Testament rests on uh, what's known as the lex talionis, which is Latin for something. Right. Basically, yeah. it's the eye for an eye, tooth mm. for a tooth um, law that we find in, 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 the, in, the, in the Pentateuch. And, and basically, this was the foundation of Old Testament law. If something has been done to you, then you do something to the other person. And that eye for an eye um, isn't supposed to be um, uh, a bad thing. It's actually putting a limit on it. It's like saying, you know, if someone has poked out your eye, well, then you are allowed to poke out their eye, but you're not allowed to poke out both eyes or chop off an arm or kill them. That would be too much. Yeah. I'm glad you said that, Ben, because a lot of people look at the Lex Talionis as as a thing that, I mean, obviously it's, in the New Testament, we see something different, but a lot of people look at that as like, oh, isn't this a terrible, awful thing? But really, it is saying you can't do more than, like, if somebody takes something from you, you can't do more than that back to them. They're trying to break that cycle of vengeance that just yes. continually goes round and round, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm. Yep, yep. That's right. It, and, and that limit was actually the new thing that, um, that the Old Testament law uh, brings in in comparison to what was going on in a lot of the countries around that time in that in that sort of context. Mm. So this is this is the psalmist's plea. It's like he's he's saying, um, I remember Jerusalem. I remember what happened to Jerusalem. And God, I want you to uh, honor your justice by doing um, the same to, to to what Babylon did to us. Mm. Um, now, look, that's a bit of a you know a bit of a downer sort of um, uh, uh, psalm. Um, uh, But I think once we get into that second part of our discussion, when we talk about sort of some applications, um, I think I've I've got a a good way of approaching it. Yeah, well, that's that's great. So what you're talking about, Ben, to everyone listening at home, is what we're doing is, uh, Dai's coined a term, uh, message momentum. So what we're doing with these Let the Psalms Speak talks is where we're going full circle and we're asking um, people who have experienced uh, express these psalms to to add a little uh, uh, um, uh, uh, applicable end to it. So some, something that we can apply to our lives to make these talks go a little bit um, more closer to home. So what these guys have done is they've 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 looked at that and they're and they're going to share. We're going to share a little bit more. We're going to talk a little bit more about how we can apply these things to our lives. And you know maybe we might delve a little bit more into why you've picked these particular psalms and um, and we'll go from there. So yeah, jump into it. Ads. What, what, why why'd you pick that yeah. one? Yeah, sure. Um, like I said, look, um, it, there's lots of songs can jump out at you at any time. I mean, you know, you read, you start reading through, and there's a lot of ones that speak to you. But I think this one speaks to me because it's, I, I tend to, I like the songs that are about God and are, are just very worshipful. Um, I contrast that. I know this isn't to be, look, and not to be snarky or anything, but a lot of times we get, you know, certain worship songs today. When you listen to, when you hear the lyrics, they tend to be, a lot of times, they tend to be more about us than actually tend to be about God. And that's not always an awful or bad thing, but sometimes that balance is off. And, and so this particular song, not to say there's not songs, there's plenty of songs that are actually about the, the, the writer of the song who's talking about how they're feeling. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I love these worshipful songs. This, this um, Psalm 29 is completely about the, the glory of Yahweh and the majesty of Yahweh. And it's trying to sort of emphasize that the power of the power of God, uh, and that that spoke to me really is to. Um, mm. Do you want to keep going with the application? Or do, <laughs> or do you, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I, how, how do you see it? Yeah, applying to every day. Like, how do you apply this? Well, we, you know, with the Psalms, I'd put this caution in because I think with the Psalms, we need to be very careful about just simply reading a Psalm and then extracting theology from, from a Psalm. We have to remember that Psalms, Psalms are poetry. And I mean, I'm sure Ben will probably talk about this with his particular Psalm, cho- psalm choice as well. Psalms are poetic verse. And so they're very cultural. 
they're very metaphorical and we don't want to look, we don't want to just read a psalm and say okay here's what it says that's what that's absolutely what god is like we need to make sure that we're always taking a psalm and reading it through the lens of, of jesus because it's jesus who shows us what god is really like and i, I just put that caution out there but this psalm 29 there's some warrior imagery uh there's there's some sort of almost, I feel like there's some destructive imagery in there that's ascribed to God. Mm. And we obviously we want to be careful with those. But if we look at the big picture of the psalm, there's a lot of stuff in the psalm that just speaks of the majesty of God. And I love the whole section about uh, Yahweh's voice. And it talks about the power of Yahweh's voice. And we can sort of relate to that, I think, because we're, we're, we're trying to listen to the voice of God on a day-to-day basis, aren't we? And trying to listen to the voice of the Spirit. So when we get this psalm about the voice of Yahweh, I think, though, rather than being that sort of still small voice that we often think of, this is a psalm about the power of Yahweh's voice and the strength of Yahweh's voice. And to me, I guess for application's sake, um, what struck me and I want to say this as delicately as I can, I think sometimes we, we've been pretty cautious in especially recent years with our images of God and we, we're trying to move away from those sort of fearful, um, what would I say, judgmental, wrathful images of God, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's well and good and we should temper those images and so we've been, you know, we've been trying to move away from images like that, but we can, unfortunately, we can balance the wrong way to the other side and get to the point where God becomes this sort of doting grandfather, hands out lollies and sweets and just does all these nice things for us. And we can forget that God is someone to be like, this is a psalm in which Yahweh, in which God is taken seriously. Like he is no one to be trifled with. And I think that's something that we could sort of balance our way back to the middle a little bit to where we say, no, we don't want those wrath. We don't want those scary images of God. Mm. Uh, We don't want those violent images of God. That's not what we see in Jesus. We don't want those violent images, but we also don't want those images of God that are just like the doting grandfather and, oh, isn't he nice and isn't he sweet and isn't he lovely? We we want to be able to balance and say, yes, he is merciful, he is good, he gives good gifts to us, but he is also someone someone we should take seriously, someone with power, someone with authority, someone with sovereignty. And that's the way this Psalm 29 speaks to me. That's awesome. Just a measure of fear, like that, you know, that, that fear of God we talk about. We, you know, yeah. it, it's invaluable. Like it really yeah. is. Yeah. Um, no, that's awesome. That's thank you. That's great. Um, what about you, Ben? Do you have something that you can add? Yep. Yep. Um, so Psalm 137 um, is often referred to as um, an imprecatory psalm. Um, imprecatory is a bit of an old word and I even had to make sure I was pronouncing it right by looking it up and yeah I think I've got it (laughs) at least for Australian um basically calling down destruction on one's enemies right and uh there's a few in Psalms in fact Psalm 139 which everyone loves um you know you knit me together in my mother's womb fearfully wonderfully made blah 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 if you keep reading (laughs) There's a bit at the end where David calls down imprecations on his enemies. Yeah. Um, so you know that that um, that psalm takes a bit of a, a bit of a sideways turn. Um, so it, it got me thinking about um, you know enemies. Now look, we don't really have enemies these days, or at least I don't know that it's a very common experience for people to have enemies. Yes, yes, discussions on Facebook can get a little bit heated. <laughs> um, you know, political uh, polarity, you know, some, sometimes, but you don't really necessarily see them as enemies as such. Mm. Um, I do have a, um, a, a friend at um, my work who has been in a horrible legal battle with his neighbour and it sounds like, you know, it is completely, it's just completely a difficult scenario and it's horrible and mm. that, that's an enemy. You know, this person is is an enemy. Um, they are not being the least bit nice and 
consider it or whatever. Mm. But I don't have any of that. And so, you know, I see some of these sort of um, the imprecatory sums and I think, well, if I don't have enemies, I don't need to worry about them. But I think there's another way of looking at these psalms, but particularly this one, Psalm 137, because of its context, um, the fact that it comes in the context of exile, um, well, exile is something that we experience mm. um, to a greater or lesser extent, you know, depending on our, um, our situation. You know, so in some ways we could talk about um, work and uh, working from home, locked down five kilometres away from everyone else, whatever, as as an experience of exile. Um, we can also, you know, ramp it up to the other extreme or other end of the spectrum and, and talk about the time between um, Jesus um, and his return as this sort of now and not yet period, which is sort of has exilic um, feel to it as well. We're, we're exiles from heaven, although I hate that concept. It's that's not the time. I know. Um, mean, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, this this idea of exile. I have a very personal uh, example. Um, my daughter Kate. Um, um, some of you will remember when she was coming to our church um, years a few years ago. Um, has been diagnosed with a, a congenital um, uh, pain condition known as ankylosing spondylitis. Mm -hmm. She's about to go on to um, a form of medication involving, uh, you know, regular injection, and, and there's good hope that that will um, deal with the uh, essentially constant pain that she's living in. Mm. Um, well, she, she just uh, was um, having friends tell her, you know, oh, Jeremiah 29.11, um, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. You know, I, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Um, and and she was sort of thinking about it, and 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 was feeling like, yeah, I do feel like that is the a verse that God is 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 saying to me now. But it just doesn't feel right because I'm in such a sad place. She was she was telling um, us this. Now I'm washing the dishes while I'm listening to her talking, and I just had this very strong sense from God that yes this verse is for her but in its full context um, I'm going to just read from Jeremiah um, 29 hmm. um, the actual um, first section of this chapter is a letter that Jeremiah is writing to the people in Babylon they've been taken into exile it's like the first batch that have been taken from Jerusalem there's still some people living in Jerusalem um, but these people in exile in Babylon, um, and, and Jeremiah writes to them, apparently there were some prophets, some false prophets that were saying, oh, you're going to be back in Jerusalem, lickety split, don't worry about it. Um, Jeremiah writes this, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your sons in and daughters, sorry, and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you have inc you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. The plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Now, I'll stop there. Uh, he goes on a little bit. But that's the, that's the key. Mm. Um, now, if you were living in Babylon and you received this letter, would you be happy? <laughs> 70 years? Probably not. 70 years is a long time. You're, especially if you're, you know, factor in how, how long people lived at that time, it'd be very, very unlikely that you living there in Babylon would ever see Jerusalem again. Mm. And that is the plans that God has for them plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. This is not the plan that you think. This is not the good that you think. This is the plans that I have. 
and they're not necessarily what you have. Now, I'm thinking this when Kate is saying, I feel like the, this verse is for me, but it, I, it, it, it's, I'm not in a happy place. It doesn't feel right. And so I just basically said, um, said to Kate, you're right. This verse is for you, but it means that God's plans for you involve you remaining in exile. That is this life with ankylosing spondylitis. Mm. However, they, those plans are to prosper you and not to harm you. So take courage. God will be with you as you go into this drug treatment. Mm. Now, she was crying. I was emotional. Um, and we hugged. And then, and then she just basically felt a real peace about the situation. Mm. And, look, I'm still praying for her that... Um, um, for a healing. Um, another aspect of Jeremiah's letter uh, speaks about that. After all, the, you know, the, the exile is going to come to an end. It's not permanent. Um, but whether that means healing in this life or whether that means waiting for the new heavens and the new earth, I don't know. Um, and so during this time of exile, this is when these sort of psalms, the, the, the psalms of lament can can come into it. Yeah. So, yes, God is with us, but in these difficult scenarios, in these difficult um, uh, situations. Um, and so, yeah, I, I feel like that then becomes another way to, um, to pray these imprecatory psalms that, you know, we're calling down... Um, destruction on our enemies well in kate's case the 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 enemy is this the sickness that she has that's it and and so all of the emotion that comes out um of those you know quite nasty difficult psalms um then finds a natural um place i guess and so yeah Yeah. we will continue to pray for her healing and we will continue to stand with her um as she's going through this this time of exile yeah. Um, but I just felt that, that was a a good way of, of of dealing with these difficult psalms. Yeah, that's so that's so fresh, man. That's so fresh to hear that. Like, like you, you, I I I sympathise so much with with the situation that you guys are going through. Um, you know, because you guys know full well that we've had our you know problems with health. You know, for the last five years and stuff. So. Um, when I, when I hear that stuff and I hear that those Psalms that seem so foreign, you know, those Psalms to me seem so foreign. Like you said, I've never had an enemy in my life. You know, mm. I wouldn't wish, you know, de- <laughs> chucking their kids off a cliff, you know, for, to, to anything. But, um, uh, but, but to me, that's, yeah, that's so fresh to hear. So thanks for that. Um, I'm, I'm just hearing. Yeah, I mean, it actually links in with um, the end of the Bible, Revelation 20, where Satan, sin and death, are thrown into the lake of fire. Those are the enemy. The, the, it even, the text even says they, the great enemies are dealt with. And then in Revelation 21 and 22, there is no crying, no pain. The mm. old order has passed away. Um, behold, yeah. all things are made new. Um, and that's the ultimate hope that we are looking for once the enemies, the, the true enemies have been dealt with. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, I was thinking, it's funny how, you know, like talking in those terms, especially like by bringing, I love that you brought in the Jeremiah passage because that one is probably the most misused and misquoted verse <laughs> <laughs> among Christians. I mean, maybe one of them. Um, it's up but there. <laughs> there's a, this is plenty of them, but there's a, there's, a, there's a certain comfort in, there's a certain comfort in the communication from God that yeah, this is your situation and you're going to not, not that God said, I mean, you know, not that we stop praying or not that we stop asking for things, but when God sort of communicates to us, this is your situation and this is the situation I want you to stay in, that hurts. But there's a certain amount of, I, I find when that happens, when I get those sorts of messages, I think to myself, well, there's a comfort in the acceptance of it. Like, okay, like almost like if this is the situation, then I'll, you know, I ask God for comfort and peace in the middle of the situation. And actually, weirdly, I feel better. I feel better when I say, okay, I'll, if this is it, then I'll cop it, you know. Um, so I, I quite like that. Yeah, that's cool. Um, it also links in with, um, just to bring in another passage, um, the opening chapters of Ezekiel. Um, 
where uh, Ezekiel has the vision of God um, on the throne with the wheels within wheels. Yes. Very, very bizarre um, passage. But the idea is um, Ezekiel is in Babylon. He, he, he is by the river of Babylon and he has this vision of God. Mm. And God's throne is on wheels. It's like God was not limited to being constricted inside the temple. Mm. Um, he, he's with them in exile. Um, and so that's the, the other great promise um, that I was sort of feeling applied to Kate as well, that, you know, he is with her in this situation. And then, of course, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, is ultimately um, the ultimate um, sign of God with us, going through uh, what it means to be human um, with the pain, suffering, sickness, death, a lot, um, and, um, and knowing that, uh, what we're going through and going through it with us. Yeah. And that's all. And that's all. And, and it feeds back into what Adam was saying, you know, like the formidability of God, you know, like, like he deserves to be feared, like he deserves to be revered. Um, you know, and he, and he is, and he is against our enemies. Like, you know, and we can broaden that Corona, you know, like we can broaden that to, to, a, to a pandemic. You know, that's an enemy of ours right now. <laughs> um, mm. Yep. Yeah, so I'm loving this thread. Um, guys, I'm conscious of time. We have seven minutes remaining on the Zoom call. So uh, I've, I've really appreciated both what you've brought. Thank you so much again. It's just so good. Um, and, Pleasure. Glad yeah, to be here with you. Yeah, <laughs> really appreciate it. And it was great to catch up. I haven't seen you guys in Yonks and I've been missing, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've been missing playing with you guys, actually. I was thinking this morning. Great, can't can't yeah, wait yeah. to get together and jam a bit. Oh, yeah. Me too. <laughs> um all right guys we'll call it there and um and uh again thank you very much uh, guys at home i hope you've enjoyed it uh you've mm. had two of the best minds at yvv <laughs> on your on your tv so hope oh, you've man. enjoyed it <laughs> <laughs> and um and until next time guys we'll see you next time all right all see right. everyone see ya, see ya. <laughs> bye-bye